When you've got a franchise as astronomically gigantic as Pokemon, there's no avenue of media or product that you can't hit. Video games, anime, manga, trading cards, toys, movies, cars, clothing, amusement park, plushies, and everyone's favorite, x-ray machines. If you were to ask people which of these avenues is the most important to the franchise, you'd find yourself commonly receiving the same two answers. Are they wrong? No, I suppose not. If the Pokemon company didn't pump out mainline games and anime episodes like a rabbit couple with a crippling Viagra addiction, I could certainly see them struggling to remain relevant, Irrelevant. or at least maintain the revenue to be the number one highest grossing media franchise in the entire world. I suppose the difference in answers lies on what's defined as important. One such definition I'd like to apply is significantly original and influential, which I seriously don't believe applies to the mainline games or the anime. Well, maybe the anime. I understand that it's been going in a rather unique and pleasant direction lately, what with the Journey series and now the Paldea one. I don't really know. I haven't watched any since XYZ. That being said, the last original and influential thing that the mainline series did was Pokemon Legends Arceus. Check out my videos on that, by the way. Which some don't even consider to be mainline. And before that, I suppose you could say the Sun and Moon Trials, or maybe the Switch to 3D and XY. In any case, the originality takes a back seat for the core Pokemon formula, which has been repeated nine times now. The horse is so far dead now that only its bones remain, and the stick is all but a twig. What does seem to fit my definition of importance is the large quantity of spin-off games, which you got a nice glimpse of in the intro. You'll notice from the title I refer to these games as providing the soul of the franchise, but how would you describe such a thing? Well, I'd like to imagine soul as essential emotional or intellectual energy or intensity. This can be applied in many ways, whether it's from a story perspective, a game mechanics and development, or even marketing. And with this video, I aim to argue that without the spin-offs, Pokemon would have no soul. Before covering the importance of the spin-offs, it'd be very amiss of me not to at least mention the ones I'm gonna be talking about, especially those I'll spend the most time on. I own many Pokemon games. It's not a problem. And if I don't have the case for it, I've likely got an electronic version somewhere anyway. That being said, I didn't grow up around the times of the N64, where one of the first occurrences of a spin-off emerged in the form of Hey You Pikachu in 1998. This was somewhat of a test from Daddy Nintendo to utilize the VRU or voice recognition unit, which was a device that could comprehend and analyze human speech with a 256 word database for Pikachu to respond to. PlayStation. There was only one other game to utilize the VRU on the N64, which uh, kind of tells you everything you need to know about its success, but still, this was a revolutionary step for advanced technological implementation in video games. It was pioneered by fucking Pikachu! The game has you taking care of a wild Pikachu by collecting food or going fishing and other activities like charging your toaster. It never had a direct sequel, but Pokemon Channel released for the GameCube in 2003 had similar gameplay without the microphone. Also released on the N64 was Pokemon Snap, a rail-driven exploration game where you take photos of wild Pokemon in their natural habitat.
There's points provided for the quality of your photos, and there's strategies involving throwing objects like apples and pesto balls. With seven levels with necessary replayability, and 63 Pokemon of the original 151, the game was a chunky bit of content. However, the coolest aspect has to be the ability to print out your photos from your N64 cartridge at your local Blockbuster or Lawson in North America and Japan respectively. Nearly 22 years later, and the game finally got a sequel in New Pokemon Snap. Really? Really? Is that what we're just doing now? It was basically the same premise as the first game, but with over 200 Pokemon, hugely updated graphics and animations, and new gameplay mechanics. New Pokemon Snap had to be one of the hypest Pokemon game reveals I've seen in a while, purely due to the immense nostalgia of a lot of long-time Pokemon fans. This next one, I don't know if I'd call it a series, but all of the games have a similar function, save two. Uh, Pokemon Stadium and Pokemon Stadium 2 on the N64 enabled players to use their ever so loved Pokemon from the first two generations in glorious 3D, with actual animations, beautiful color, and best of all, great footage for false swipe gaming. And in short, Pokemon Colosseum did basically the same thing for the Generation 3 games and Pokemon Battle Revolution for the Generation 4 games. Looking back at Colosseum and XD Gale of Darkness though, the 3D titles for the GameCube, these fuckers had insanely different stories where you play as an ex-villain or this guy trying to rescue Pokemon whose hearts are corrupted with darkness. And that's fucking cool! It gave us this badass bitch after all. Unfortunately, Battle Revolution for the Wii didn't have some grandiose story with animated cutscenes. It mainly just had the battles. But it was still it was still cool, I, I promise. I pr this is a movie. It's a movie that's a sequel to a spin-off of a sequel to Shrek. You would think that with that many degrees of separation from the main IP, it'd be quite the flop. But no, instead it was quite the hit. Likewise, this video game, Pokemon Ranger, is a spin-off to a trainer class in the games with basically no information about them. The main character of this game is introduced in the anime, however. In one episode. The episode The Green Guardian debuted in Japan on December 8, 2005, and the first Pokemon Ranger game debuted in Japan on March 23, 2006, not too long before the next Ranger-centered anime episode. Could you imagine something like this happening in real life? Shit! Haha! <laughs> Would you happen to be Tracker Base, the guy who showed up for 40 seconds and did the outro for Gamer Cream in the hit video How Stardew Valley Trampled the Farming Genre at the timestamp of 43 minutes and 37 seconds with a deadpan scripted voice and cream in the background? Uh. Yeah? Oh, then I could be your agent. Let me tell you, baby, I'm gonna make you a star. The Pokemon Company sure had some balls to have HAL Laboratory and Creatures Inc. make an entire game based around a Pokemon character archetype that wasn't nearly fleshed out enough. Despite this, the series received two sequels which were also on the DS, which at the very least shows that the Ranger character was quite a popular one. The idea behind them was basically wildlife protection or restoration less of permanent capture a la Pokeballs, and more so the vegetarian alternative, where they use special devices to temporarily tame and call upon Pokemon for assistance. Personally, I loved the ability to play as someone who wasn't a trainer. It helps to expand the world building and provides diversity within the story world that is Pokemon. I wanna be the very best. I know, we've been trying to be the very best since 1996. Please, just let me be a gym leader, or a Pokemon coordinator, or a Pokemon breeder. These would make for some super interesting games. I'm gonna go more in depth on this topic later in the video, but I thought now would be best to bring it up, considering it's Pokemon Ranger and all. Pokemon Conquest also released on the DS. It was a mix of Pokemon and another popular Japanese game series, Nobunaga's Ambition. Playing as a young new warlord of a kingdom, you set out to conquer 16 other kingdoms that represent the Pokemon types in a turn-based, top-down grid battlefield, akin to that of Fire Emblem. This one is legitimately my absolute favorite Pokemon spin-off and definitely deserves its own video. Let me know if you'd like that down in the comments. This right here is my favorite thing ever.
in the history of forever. I think about this every day. I think about this all night long. I stay awake, not sleeping, because I'm thinking about this. The humans have so much character and stellar design. The Pokemon have so much life to them and the selection is immaculate. Oh, and the gameplay is just so intricate. I've just, I've got, I've got to stop myself and, and move on. The Nintendo Wii gave us the Poke Park series where you play as Pikachu and eventually the Unova starters and traverse an expansive and open world, running, jumping and fighting as the Pokemon themselves never felt so freeing. The gameplay mainly revolves around exploration and mini games, all of which make great usage of the Wii Remote movement functionality. It's got a very happy-go-lucky vibe. No need to worry about the end of the world looming over you. Just forget about that part. All of the spin-off games seem to have much more interesting plot beats than the main series games. Sure, there's exceptions throughout, but the goal never really falters beyond beat the gyms and become the champion. I'd say the greatest outliers exist in two games, Pokemon Black and White, with their focus on Team Plasma and N, making for a far more intricate and intertwined storyline besides the main goal, and the very last hour or two of gameplay of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which I will stand by as being the greatest Pokemon experience from the mainline series in a long time. We don't talk about the rest of the game though. Oh, score! Hello, Jay. I'm not dead, but do you know all that money I got from selling illegal arms to fund contra militaries in impoverished countries? I used it to get you something. Enjoy. Hey, what the fuck? This is all just garbage. Boy, what an amazing present! Thank you, Gamer Cream, for providing my meal this week. Back on Poke Park, its story and gameplay are about the Pokemon, and the Pokemon are the drive behind the success of the franchise. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We'll talk more about that later. It's honestly one of the most fun experiences on a console like the Wii. Pokemon Rumble also debuted on the Wii which started out as nothing more than some WiiWare game, but it eventually evolved into its own series, with two games on the 3DS and one on the Wii U. And no other installments. This one is a pretty big graphical shift to toy Pokemon, who you play as and go through the levels, using moves and recruiting more Pokemon as you go. There's certainly not as much depth behind these games, but the gameplay change is so drastic that I really don't think it matters. There's also an aspect of microtransactions in Rumble World, which I outwardly despise, but it's nowhere near necessary, unlike a lot of mobile-like games these days. Speaking of mobile games, I actually played a shitload of Pokemon Quest, and I did spend real money on it. I guess I was hoping it'd be more fleshed out in the future with a bunch of updates, but nope. Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break my monitor, I swear. Next, we've got the 3DS with Detective Pikachu. It's not that bad. I mean, the gameplay style is not particularly my taste. It's a detective game where you move around, point and click and choose dialogue options. Hold it! I just needed to distract you. But the important thing is the building of the Pokemon world, which I believe it does quite well. It tells a realistic and interesting plot through the usage of the knowledge of the Pokemon world and their abilities, even extending to its sequel on the Nintendo Switch this year. It's a vastly different genre while still incorporating what makes Pokemon so intriguing. And for that, I must applaud the series. Plus, it's thanks to this game that we got the very first live action Pokemon movie with Fluffy Pikachu, Scaly Charizard, and Eldritch being Mewtwo. I actually really love this movie, by the way, and saying I desperately need a live action movie with traditional trainers and battles is a huge understatement. 
Speaking of Pokemon battles though, Pokken Tournament, originally released for the Wii U with its deluxe version releasing on the Nintendo Switch, is exactly what it sounds like. Pokemon crossed with Tekken, a fully fleshed out Pokemon 2D slash 3D fighting game with killer animations and character, incredibly neat mechanics, and an unfortunate competitive decline as a result of EVO 2016. This is honestly another game I could do a whole video's length in. Anyone want to play Pokken after this? Who could that be? doing here? <laughs> oh, I was just in the neighbourhood and I heard you were doing a smashing video on Pokemon spin-offs. Do you want a wee quick 1v1? It may be good for the video. Fine, why not? Well, that was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Yeah, cause someone who spams bullshit special moves, that's fun. Pop in Pokemon TCG for the Game Boy, and then we'll see who the real daddy is. Yeah, that sounds like fun. But, uh... What's a Game Boy? Game Boy, Game Boy, Game Boy, Game Boy, Game Boy. Oh, <laughs> that's a pretty old one. Came out more than 20 years, 20 ago. years ago. Oh, and then maybe next we can play the new Pokemon games. Pokemon Ohio and Pokemon Sigma. Sigma, Sigma. Now there's one series in particular that I've left for last, and for good reason too. It's the greatest, most immersive, most expansive, most interesting, most popular series to ever come out of the Pokemon spin-offs. That's right, Pokemon Pinball. Anyway, Mystery Dungeon is a series that began all the way back in 2005 when Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team and Blue Rescue Team released on November 17th for the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS respectively. Already we're seeing an interesting dichotomy of the series. Two games, basically the same, just like Red and Blue, but on different hardware. The game has the player take control of one of 16 different Pokemon, mainly starters with a few wild cards sprinkled in as well. The player character is actually a human come to the Pokemon world by some mysterious voice or entity or dream teleportation. It's, it's all the same stuff in the different ways for each of the different games. You then meet with another one of these 16 Pokemon who becomes your lifelong Pokemon pal. Actually, I shouldn't say pal anymore, should I? and you take on special requests together as a rescue team, whose job it is to serve and protect Pokemon in need. You go about these requests in dungeons, which are 2D mapped out levels with randomized layouts every time, using moves and items to explore. Completing the dungeons net you story progression and rewards, with the aim basically to just complete them all, or complete the story at the very least. The story of Mystery Dungeon is always the most interesting. There's got to be a reason for a random human to be transported to the Pokemon world, whether it's to destroy a meteor, unfuck the time crisis, prevent a global freezing, or kill Medusa herself, the stories all typically revolve around saving the world. And yet, each time it's different, with a variety of new characters and Pokemon, new gameplay mechanics, and of course, a real heart-shattering realization at the end. Maybe the real Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky was the friends we made along the way. What sets Mystery Dungeon apart is its great writing, where it can provide proper emotional beats, character development, and twists. And why it deserves to be together with all the others has to do with its implementation of Pokemon abilities and lore into a new world that the player is able to explore. Something that is such a far cry from anything the main series has been able to accomplish. That's basically it but I know I didn't mention some of your potential favorites. There's a plethora of mobile games out there that I still have to give credit to for at least being interesting and new, but I certainly wouldn't describe any of them as having soul. A majority of them all can just be major cash grabs or purely disinteresting. Unite and Go will get some screen time, but it's not like I'm gonna be praising them, so don't expect anything from me. I hope you're ready for more ramblings though. Here come the hot takes.
Yeah, that's right. There's something odd about the fear that the Pokemon Company and Game Freak have about straying away from the core series, potentially limiting their growth. At the end of the day, if we knew Legends Arceus would be coming, I don't think anyone actually needed a Gen 4 remake, but they did one anyway. But who am I to talk? The sales of Sword and Shield and Scarlet and Violet should speak for themselves. We're at a point in Pokemon history where I can say that game sales don't necessarily well, no, they definitely do not quantify quality. Pokemon games are so trapped within their own formula that quality spin-off games are getting rarer and rarer. There are benefits to this though. It means that spin-off games don't have to rely on the main series to tell a coherent and immersive standalone story. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. You could have played none of the mainline games and only the Mystery Dungeon series and you'd still be a huge Pokemon fan with just the knowledge of the franchise's existence. Pokemon as a whole has never really had to deal with relying on its prequels, for better or for worse. For example, I would really, really appreciate it if I could actually skip the catching tutorial. I've been playing this game for 12 years, I know how to throw a ball! Yeah. There's only some minor occurrences of it happening in direct sequels, and even then, the references to previous games are mainly just easter eggs. This is going to sound like a crazy comparison, but think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When it was good, all the movies, bar their sequels, would stand on their own as individual stories, and you could afford to have not seen a few to still enjoy the climactic Avengers get-togethers. Nowadays though, there's too much content to keep track of. There's more movies than ever, most of which are pretty subpar. We've got an overwhelming amount of TV streaming series on Disney Plus with spin-offs of their own, and yet somehow I'd still be expected to be excited for the big team up in the Avengers movies? No thanks. Pokemon, I believe, suffers from the inverse of this problem. There isn't enough unique content for me to care about it. Here's what's happened recently with Pokemon. Hi there, it's me, uh, editing Trackerbase from the future. I just want to let you know that I'm about to talk about a lot of Pokemon Presents things from like last year because I started this writing this video last year. So yes, I do know about the Pokemon Presents that happened a, like a little while ago and I do know about the new Legends ZA game and I'm very excited about it. Thank you for all your comments about it that I'm sure you're going to write, but I'm just putting a disclaimer here because I know I was gonna, you know, someone was gonna mention it. First, the main series DLC. Paid extra content adding to an already completed story. The hidden treasure of Area Zero. My ass, dude. The teal mask had almost nothing to do with Area Zero and the time travel stuff. And then the Indigo disc had us go there for like 15 minutes at the end. At this point, it's just padding for extra playtime and competitive battling necessity. Secondly, Pokemon Go, a mobile game, updates which is basically DLC anyway. I know it was the biggest Pokemon boom of all time, but that ship has sailed literally off the edge of the earth and has been burnt up by Alpha Centauri. Pokemon also never really clicked for me as a mobile experience outside of mini games. I'm not sitting down on my phone to play The Last of Us. I'm playing a Jetpack Joyride and Subway Surfers. Thirdly, Pokemon Unite update. Not quite a mobile game, but close enough. Also, again, basically just DLC. Are you noticing a trend here? Pokemon Master Sex, my bad. Pokemon Masters EX update. I actually played this game for quite a while. Well, until the gacha elements caused me to run to my overseas sugar daddy for support. Oh, and it's basically DLC, again. Fifth, oh, here we go, we've got some new games. Pokemon Sleep and Pokemon Cafe? What the fuck, man, I'm done. And sixth, Detective Pikachu Returns. Okay, now we've got an actual Honest to God spin-off. Not a super popular one, but I'll take it. I bet they have a lot of info on this game on the Pokemon official website. Holy shit, it didn't even make the news when it released. Trying to edge Go and Unite and other mobile games to such an extent is painful. I remember when games were good without DLC, but it seems like now it's more of an excuse to waste time on shit that nobody cares about. The last spin-off game I remember getting DLC was Pokémon Tournament DX, which is already a good game. DLC does not fit my definition of important. It's not original or influential. Everyone does it. 
and it's all about extending, 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 extending. You know what is influential? Breakout ideas with a unique premise. Who actually cared about that one Pokemon Ranger character before the game, huh? Who could have imagined a Pokemon themed amusement park, huh? Who could have imagined Pokemon fighting alongside Warlords in Imperial Japan before Conquest, huh? This shit is revolutionary. What soul is there in DLC also? How does this at all describe intellectual energy or intensity? Her dur, pay more money for the same stuff you've already been playing. It's the most recent scummy technique to rely on DLC in gaming. And then don't even use it to fix the actual problems. And I am not above using the L word. And this brings me to my next point. For the spin-off games, often providing that intellectual or emotional intensity is pretty easy, considering that they all basically... I get that dungeon crawling isn't everyone's favourite genre of gameplay. I enjoy it, but even I can admit it's quite a tedious activity after a few hours. That being said, genre shifting is very much appreciated. The mainline series is a very typical RPG, running around from point A to point B, battling enemies in turn-based format, and gaining experience and leveling up and passing checkpoints. It's the same song and dance we've seen a million times before. That's not to say it's not a good game genre. You give me an exciting RPG and I'll play it regardless. But in the subsphere of Pokemon, there obviously needs to be some diversity between games, especially spin-offs. Conquest is turn-based, top-down, grid 6v6 RPG akin to Fire Emblem. Mystery Dungeon is a dungeon crawler x kinda a visual novel? What do you think? Poke Park is open world slash area exploration. Hokken is a 2D 3D fighting game. Detective Pikachu is mystery point and click. And Pokemon Ranger is a circle drawing simulator. All of them bring something new to the table, and I'm going to go over which I think are the most influential. Starting with Poke Park, it's easy to see where you can draw inspiration for open world Pokemon. Honestly, it's kind of like Legends Arceus with the areas you can travel to with different environments. And sure, the latest mainline games have been open world exploration, but Poke Park was out in 2010! I saw a post on X that was pertaining to one of the new updates in the Pokemon DLC for Scarlet and Violet. The post basically said, Oh my, I'm so happy I can move around as the Pokemon themselves. I can't believe this is what I was looking for from Pokemon games. Almost every single reply I saw to that post was people linking Poke Park or Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, which just goes to show that we've had what Pokemon fans want for ages, but Game Freak just wasn't proactive enough. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon being a level traversal through randomly changing floor layouts adds another layer of diversity. It can be repetitive, but so is me sitting in front of a pokey machine rolling slots for six hours, and I've never had a problem with gambling. But it does a pretty solid job of trying to keep the experience fresh and new, with mechanics, gimmicks, moves and items anyway. Besides, Mystery Dungeon, despite its name, mainly draws its popularity from its visual novel-esque storytelling. Pokemon reactions in the little boxes in the corner add more to the experience than you'd first think. Detective Pikachu isn't one of those, whoa, so cool, genre shifts, but I cannot overstate the importance of having a more tame gameplay style that isn't an RPG in a franchise littered with them. You can really delve into specific environments and Pokemon interactions with a detective mystery game, and I certainly can't say that the plot is boring or anything. It keeps you on the line just enough to solve the mystery, which I suppose is exactly what the genre expects you to do. And then there's Pokken. Whoa! It's an absolute gold mine to have a Pokemon fighting game. This is what every little kid thought Pokemon Battle should look like, and while that's pretty high on the spectrum of asking for too much, Pokken is a phenomenal way to satisfy that urge and provide the close combat Pokemon battling experience we've all been searching for. The Pokemon and trainer in this universe connect with each other through some kind of headset brain device? How do you think that works? Like, telepathic commands? Or do you think it's more like shadow boxing, like the hit 2011 movie, Real Steel? Oh yeah, kill him Lucario, fuck yeah, break his legs, punch him in the face. Oh, this is so cool, it's like I get to fight the other guy without getting into an actual fight. Yo, why is it kind of getting close though? <laughs> Due to the absolute detail that goes into each individual fighter, the roster has to be relatively small. 
and the selection is just about perfect. Every single option is a fan favorite. It's very likely you've got a highly endeared Pokemon within this list. The gameplay is so dynamic with its use of Pokemon moves and different abilities. Decidueye being able to fly, Darkrai having a powered up Bad Dreams mode, Pikachu Libre being a grappler, it all just makes sense. The stylized animations, sound effects and noises, and graphics surpass anything that the main series has to offer, and it's truly a love letter to longtime fans as well as new ones. And these devs must have been smoking the same shit as the devs from Gale of Darkness, cause Oh boy, hot mama, that's sexy. Switching your genres around within the video game franchise can seriously improve the overall reception, as well as provide the fans with what they want, even if they don't know it yet. And that, I'd say, is pretty damn important to building a layer of trust between consumer and company that is so vital to continued success. You're someone who's usually too lazy to do any extra research unless it's super interesting to you, right? Because that's me, and I'm only doing this because I love making videos and I love Pokemon. Nothing more. As such, a quick Google search or Wikipedia article will tell you that none of these spin-off games are actually made by Game Freak, the company that typically handles all the mainline titles. The Pokemon company is the big puppet master behind it all, but you'll see quite the variety of game development companies among these spin-offs, like Chunsoft, Hal Laboratory, Creatures Incorporated, Tecmo Koei, Bandai Namco, and Genius Sorority. Hell, we saw this recently with Ilka developing Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl while Game Freak worked on Legends Arceus. It shows a lot of integrity and maturity to trust your IP in the hands of several different development companies, especially if you haven't worked with them before. Sure, everyone works with the same framework and IPs, but the originality that comes with different developers provides a breath of fresh air not only to consumers, but the developers as well. Without Pokemon Snap, Namco may have never gotten a shot at working with Pokemon, which means that we may have never gotten Pokken Tournament, and that's a world I refuse to live in. Game Freak is great at making the mainline games. Well, most of the time. But would I trust a 3D fighting game in their hands like the Evo 1997 masterpiece Star Wars Masters of Terrace Kasi? Of course not. With spin-off games, the Pokemon company really has the opportunity to open the door for new or existing developers and give them a chance at success. And it's not like everyone else isn't completely clawing and would kill for a chance to be able to make a Pokemon game. Recent criticisms would argue that Game Freak has forgotten this fact, almost as if they, they don't care about providing the true quality that the king of media deserves. Personally, I'd like to see a different company take on the mainline games, and certainly one with a lot more members. Genius Sonority was amazing on Colosseum. They really knew how to make the Pokemon feel like Pokemon in a 3D battle environment. Or fuck it, how about you actually just give the mainline series to Nintendo? When it came to BDSP, I know a lot of people weren't too happy with Ilka's rendition of the classic Diamond and Pearl. But to be honest, for a 2D top-down experience that rekindles the old fans, I'd say they pulled off what they were trying to achieve. They definitely needed the Platinum stuff though. Plus, having Ilka work on BDSP enabled the creation of Legends Arceus, proving that Game Freak can make amazing Pokemon games. They just have to stop limiting themselves by unnecessarily pumping out whatever slop they can for that year. All this is to say that the Pokemon company already has an avenue to bring aboard new development companies to work with their IPs and not compromise their overall image, and it's through the spin-off games. I can't tell if the Pokemon Company and Game Freak have forgotten that their audience isn't just kids anymore, or if they simply do not give a fuck. Video games are many things, a recreational activity, a hobby, a profession, but most of all, an escape from reality. Why the fuck would I want to go to school in a video game when I can be a badass guy with spider powers? I'm not just speaking for myself right here right now, but also my little kid self. When I was a small bludger, I still wanted to be the epic superhero, or the spellcasting wizard, or the monster wielding I don't take shit from nobody trainer. Not some wimpy kid in a school uniform that I can't even change out of- oh come on! In Pokemon Snap, you play as Todd Snap, an upcoming photographer who ventures deep into caves, across valleys, and into volcanoes for his endeavours. 
The notion of trainers is a non-issue because they don't impact the gameplay, as they shouldn't. If I'm playing a game where I'm supposed to be a photographer, I shouldn't be thrust into the role of catching and battling Pokemon. That would be like if halfway through editing a video, Dex suddenly decided to send me to Mexico to marry a cartel member's daughter in his place after he misjudged exactly how much the Jalafuego Jalapeno would burn the arse pop of his jeans and then telling me it's just for the video. No, this hasn't happened before. Why are you looking at me like that? In Pokemon Ranger Shadows of Almia, you play as a new ranger. And yes, I know they go to school too, but that's legitimately like only the first 10% or less of gameplay. And the progression of ranger capabilities and maturity is evident and compelling regardless. Oh, and also one of the teachers is an evil mastermind. I want to take a pick. After graduating, the player becomes the area ranger of their hometown where they must protect the citizens and Pokemon. Trouble emerges with Team Dim Sun, a group who uses devices to control Pokemon for their own evil endeavors. Meeting with other high-ranking rangers and some familiar faces, the player makes their way up the ranks, all whilst dealing with Team Dim Sun. A big twist reveals the true identity of the leader of Dim Sun, who tries to use a powerful Pokemon controlling device to take over the world. The mere ability to play as such a role is a dream of big proportions taking down basically the Mafia as a hero to all. The story itself, along with the interactions between characters and the dialogue and the animations, just scream every ounce of soul the game has. But again, in all fairness, these spin-off games kind of require to have a compelling plot, or else all you're left with is... In Poke Park 2 Wonders Beyond for the Wii, you get to play as Pikachu, Oshawott, Snivy, and Tepig. Pikachu and his friend Piplup are introduced to a new dimension called Wish Park, which seems like a nice and dandy place to be if it wasn't actually meant to trap and entrance its inhabitants, keeping them there forever. Piplup gets captured, so Pikachu teams up with the Unova starters to open gates to Wish Park through friendship power. No, that's, that's literally what it's called. And defeat the attraction bosses. With every new Pokemon Wish Park captures, the dark vortex in the sky grows bigger eventually revealed to be the work of Darkrai. Damn! After being defeated, Darkrai realizes the error of his ways and sacrifices himself. Now this story is far, far more tame in terms of maturity, mainly focusing on the themes of friendship, which is fine. That's what the Pokebuck series is all about. Sometimes a story can just be happy-go-lucky with a hint of conflict. And to have a game like Pokebuck revolve around such a story and still be a great game, is a wonderful showcase of manipulating the emotional energy and intensity. The soul of Poke Park comes through in its innocence, but it isn't trying to coddle the player or remind them that they're just a kid or downplay the severity of the situation, even if you know the good guys are going to win. I also believe it's felt in the gameplay. The developers really understood how to make using Pokemon moves make sense in a 3D environment. The four characters each only get two, well, kind of three each, but that's all that's really necessary to see Pikachu's classic Thunderbolt and Iron Tail. It's like mainline Pokemon where you spam the same move, but you can actually move around and feel part of the battle. Pokemon Conquest, bless this game, is set in Imperial Japan. Oh, my mistake. Rensei, which is a region that has its land made to look like Arceus. Oh my god! A beautiful little detail there, and I've barely even gotten into the game. You play as a new warlord who's in control of Aurora, the normal type kingdom. You and your teammate Oichi, who control their own Pokemon, Eevee and Jigglypuff, are attacked by the Fire Kingdom Ignis, the leader of which claiming that taking over other kingdoms is the way to success as a warlord. By taking their kingdom in return, what the dog doing? The player learns of the powerful warlord Nobunaga who is trying to hold all of Rensei under his palm. By taking more and more kingdoms and recruiting their warlords and warriors, the player can finally defeat Nobunaga, as well as his rematch team with Arceus against his <gasps> shiny Rayquaza. Oh my God, I'm going to faint. That's a pretty neat story in itself, but wait, that's not all. There are dozens of following side stories that star all the other warlords and warriors, offering hours and hours of playtime. The grid-based movement and attacks and maps and chibi Pokemon are also unique and flavorful. The background art of kingdoms and the art and expression of the warlords and warriors all have so much character and love poured into their creation. I especially love the poses where it almost seems as though the Pokemon are interacting with their warrior. The soul of this game really boils down to the characters, their skills, their Pokemon, and their dialogue, helping the player build a deeper connection to them rather than them just being their weapon. 
and of course, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. The player as a Pokemon is washed ashore and meets with their soon to be lifelong friend and retrieves their precious relic fragments from some bullies. They enlist at Wigglytuff's guild as exploration members, a long time dream of the partner Pokemon. They learn of the criminal Grovile. Sin, Sin City was a mavia who is stealing relics called Time Gears, which hold the balance of time in place and cause it to stop in areas where it is stolen. Oh yeah, also, the player character has glimpses into the past and the future. The guild hires an explorer named Dust Noir to help arrest Grovile, and the clairvoyance that the player experiences is learned to be called Dimensional Scream. Dust Noir says the Time Gears will freeze the world if they're all stolen. So, with the help of Yuxi, Mesprit, and Azelf, he captures Grovile and puts the Time Gears back. Instead of leaving with Grovile, Dustmar also takes the player and the partner into the future with him, leaving them in a prison where they narrowly escape execution. Grovile explains that the future got paralyzed because Temporal Tower collapsed and corrupted its head, Dialga, into the tyrannical Primal Dialga. Stupid man thing! I'm fucking bawling! Dust Noir is actually the bad guy, and Grovile was working with a human to get the Time Gears and restore Temporal Tower. Turns out the human was actually the player character the whole time. And then Celebi helps them return to the present. Grovile gathers the Time Gears again, and the player and their partner enlist the help of Wigglytuff's guild to stop the collapse of the tower. Dust Noir appears and tells the player that if they were to restore the tower, the future as they know it would disappear, along with they themselves. Despite this, Grovile sacrifices himself to drag Dust Noir into the future, and the player presses on. They reach the top, defeat Primal Dialga, and restore time, only to lead to the player saying their final goodbyes and disappearing forever. It's one of the most emotional moments in all of Pokemon, as the player sits on the rolling credits. Thankfully, Dialga helps the partner bring their friend back at the end, and the rest of the game can continue. Explorers of Time and Darkness are just such genuinely good stories with satisfying payoffs, pretty decent dialogue, and great visuals for a 2D DS game. The Mystery Dungeon games appear to be the series that actually takes Pokemon into the niche, sci-fi, or fantastical worlds that has only ever really been seen in the anime. And I think this is exactly what the mainline games need to take that step further and really push boundaries on a great game. The Area Zero arc of Scarlet and Violet was genuinely some of the greatest awe I experienced in Pokemon. Why? Because it had amazing dialogue between characters, a dope ass fucking plot, and an awesome concept of bringing Pokemon from the past and the future and an AI professor who gets corrupted and just, ah, it's so cool. We need more of this stuff. How about biological enhancements to Pokemon, like that popular ROM hack, Infinite Fusion? Or how about an underground Pokemon fighting ring, like that scene in the Detective Pikachu movie? Or what about Pokemon being poached and sold like Jurassic World? Okay, maybe I'm stretching it on the mature themes, but my mind can just go crazy with the possibilities. Most of all, it's about the Pokemon, what they can do, and what you can do with that. And if you can make some damn compelling characters, you've got yourself one hell of a game. I think it's only through these unorthodox spin-off games that such soul can be realized. I thought I'd stop somewhere around the halfway point, but I guess my fingers wouldn't stop typing this script. There's just so much content to cover, and I had so much that I wanted to say, and even then I don't think I said everything I wanted to. Thanks for sticking around if you did. I thought about this topic for a while now, and I'm glad that it finally came to fruition. If you did enjoy my rambling, maybe leave a like and subscribe if you want to catch more videos like this. I think I've got the thoughts available to do a video on Pokemon Conquest or Pokken Tournament, but I don't really know, you'll just have to keep following me to find out. Or if you want, leave in the comments some other Nintendo games that maybe you want me to cover. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.